Hi, everybody. My name is Tom Lurie, uh, and today we're going to cover two recent federal, uh, excuse me, Supreme Court cases that have uh, reversed the federal circuit. Um, the first case is the T.C. Heartland case, which has, um, depending on your perspective, either restored the venue law to what it used to be or changed the venue law from what it used to be. And we'll talk about that a little bit. And we'll talk about uh, what ramifications there are for the, in the T.C. Heartland world now. Um, and the second case that we're going to talk about is the Lexmark case. Uh, Chris will be talking about that case. And that case um, has changed the law in terms of patent exhaustion and expanded what patent exhaustion is. And, and Chris will give some insights and thoughts on that. So that's an overview of where we're going today. Um, so to start with, uh, T.C. Heartland versus Kraft Foods. Um, this case came from the, um, the uh, Federal Circuit. And as you can see in the slide that's on the screen now, um, at the time the court decided T.C. Heartland, there was a fairly heavy emphasis of cases being filed in the Eastern District of Texas. Um, pretty much, uh, as you can see, 36% of the cases were there. And if you look at the other bubble, 37% uh, were in all other districts. So that's a, that's a lot of cases being filed in the Eastern District of Texas in 2016. Uh, the District of Delaware had the next most cases, and then uh, California, uh, Northern District, Central District, combined at about 10%, and then Northern District of Illinois was the other major place where cases were being filed. Um, as, as everyone knows, there's this concern that Eastern District of Texas is getting its uh, disproportional share of the patent cases these days, and so whether that was in the minds of the judges, the justices, when they decided T.C. Heartland or not, it's hard to know but certainly that's been an issue for quite a while. Um, if you look at the comparative data in terms of damage awards, it's, it's interesting too, because although ED Texas has the highest number of cases by far filed, it is not the district where the predominant damages have been awarded. It's, it's second on the list, which is still pretty high up the list, of course, but as you can see from this list, the District of Delaware, on average, um, awards more in damages than Eastern District of Texas does. And then you can see followed by Virginia, Massachusetts, and so forth. Eastern District of Michigan at the bottom there, which is uh, my home district uh, in the Detroit area, um, I say it's where patents go to die, and the statistics seem to reflect that. Um, so the, as, you, as we'll talk about, uh, one of the things that people are predicting is that after T.C. Heartland, more cases will go to Delaware. Um, that raises the question in light of these statistics, whether that's good for patent owners or bad for patent owners. Um, you might say that at one level, patent owners don't realize that Delaware is maybe a better place for them to be. But uh, we'll, we'll explore that as we go on. Um, so a little background on how T.C. Heartland got to the Supreme Court. Um, T.C. Heartland is a company based in Indiana, um, located there, and Kraft Foods is a Delaware corporation. Uh, Kraft sued T.C. Heartland in Delaware, its home forum. Um, and the allegation was that T.C. Heartland was shipping products into Delaware, and that was the basis for venue. Um, under the existing Federal Circuit law, uh, that was appropriate because, as we'll talk about under BE Holdings, the, um, the venue essentially is as broad as personal jurisdiction under BE Holding. And so the district court denied the motion to dismiss or transfer, and the Federal Circuit um, denied the petition for mandamus that T.C. Heartland had filed. So T.C. Heartland was one of the brave souls who said, well, wait a minute, 
um, even though this uh, VE holding case has been around for 20 years, we don't believe it. Um, and, and so we're taking this up on mandamus and the federal circuit basically said now VE Holdings is right and we're not going to revisit it. So that's what led ultimately to the petition to the Supreme Court, sir. And um, as part of the background, it's important to understand the relevant venue statutes and know what they say. Um, they've changed over the years, and we'll talk a little bit about that, how they've changed, but in substance, they've been the same. So some of the language has changed, some of the terminology has changed, but substantively, there really hasn't been any difference since the earliest set of venue statutes in the 1800s. Um, so uh, the basic venue statute for patents, as most of you already know, it says you can bring a patent infringement suit in the judicial district where the defendant resides, and that's one possibility, or where the defendant has A, committed acts of infringement, and B, has a regular and established place of business. So those are two alternatives. T.C. Hartland only addressed the very first of those, which is where the defendant resides. T.C. Hartland did not comment on or discuss the second half of the test or the alternative test, which is committing acts of infringement and having a regular place of business in the judicial district. And we'll talk about what that means to all of us as we go forward, too. So that's 1400B, 28 USC. And the, um, the predecessor of T.C. Harlan, Supreme Court predecessor, is the Forco case I've got mentioned on the slide here. And, and that is a case from 1957 where the Supreme Court held that resides means incorporated. Um, in 1990, the Federal Circuit uh, said that resides is coextensive with subject matter jurisdiction because the general venue statute, 1391, in subsection C, says for purposes of this chapter, which would include 1400, a defendant that is a corporation shall be deemed to reside in any judicial district in which it is subject to personal jurisdiction at the time of the, the action is commenced. So the Federal Circuit reading that general jurisdiction definition for corporations said, okay, well that helps us, helps inform what resides means when a defendant is a corporation and therefore we can say that for 1400, the corporation's residence is wherever there is subject matter jurisdiction. So that's what the holding said in um, 1990. Um, the reason, so Forco was the law at the time, and VE Holding considered Forco and decided that um, what changed was that there was a revision to Section 1391 where they added the words for purposes of venue under this chapter. And so the Federal Circuit said, based on that, we are going to apply those words literally, and since the chapter applies to the entire venue chapter, including 1400, we're going to apply the 1391C definition. And so they came up with their ruling that Forco was no longer the law. So we've been operating under VE Holding now for 27 years. Um, as I say, it was a brave T.C. Hartland who said, now the Federal Circuit got it wrong all those many years ago. Um, and, and so they raised, raised it to the Supreme Court. It was a unanimous decision by the Supreme Court, not surprisingly in patent cases. It's very rare to see any dissent. The only reason it wasn't 9-0 was because Justice Gorsuch was not yet, uh, had not participated in the oral argument and therefore was not a member of the court uh, who heard the case. Um, so it was 8-0, it would have been 9-0, I'm sure, if, if Justice Gorsuch had been on the, heard the case as well. It uh, reverses the Federal Circuit, 
rejects BE Holdings and decided that the, uh, the change by the Congress in the language of 1391 did not affect Forco at all. Um, it's interesting when you go through the history of T.C. Heartland, Forco, and there's an even earlier case, Stonite, from the Supreme Court that was decided in the 1940s. All of them have essentially the same facts, and those facts are that there is a specific venue statute for patent cases. Um, in the later cases, it was 1400. In the earlier cases, it was just part of the uh, statutes at large. Um, but the language was essentially the same. Um, again, some wording differences, but in terms of meaning, no differences at all. And it, in Stonite, which is the 40s case, it first came up that while the general venue statute has a definition of a corporation, and therefore, shouldn't that definition of a corporation apply to the more particular patent venue statute when it comes to deciding where a corporation is inhabited? That was the terminology then, uh, resides today. And Stonite said, no, the, the special venue statute for patents is the only statute that matters. It's the only statute we look at, and we don't incorporate anything from the general language of the venue statutes. So that was Stonite. There was a series of circuit court cases that were applying Stonite, and they, there ended up being a split among the circuits. And so the Supreme Court in Forco took the banner up. And by that time, the statutes had been rewritten into what we now know as 1391 and 1400, and so there was the uh, split of authority in the circuits who thought, some who thought that, for, that Stonite was still good law and still applied, and others who said, no, Congress has changed the statutes and rewritten them, and so therefore we will um, apply the definition that exists in 1391C to uh, 1400. Uh, the Supreme Court in Forco said, no, that's wrong. Uh, for the special venue statute is a standalone statute. It does not incorporate anything else. And therefore, um, the residence at that point, they change it to residence. The, the corporation, the residence of corporation does not come from the general definition. Um, and then, as I said, along came the Federal Circuit and said, no, Forco doesn't apply any longer because there was a change to 1391, and, and then we come to T.C. Ireland. T.C. Ireland says, we keep saying it, people. You're not listening. <laughs> and it's there's a special venue statute for patent cases. It's standalone. It doesn't incorporate anything else into the definition of residence. So that's where we end up. And, and from that perspective, it's very simple. Um, the Supreme Court has been consistent since the 1940s that the place of inhabitation of a corporation or the place of residence of a corporation is only the state in which it is incorporated. That's the beginning and the end of the analysis for residence for corporation. So if, if that's all there were to this case, then there wouldn't be much to talk about. The, um, the uh, wrinkle comes in, of course, that the statute talks about the second Part of the test, which is an alternative test, and now we're faced with you have the choice of if you're suing a corporation, do you sue them in their state of incorporation, which is certainly a possibility, and that leads to Delaware, or do you try the second half of the test and say, well, we want to look at their regular and established place of business and see if there's any infringement in that location. And so that's where people are now focusing as they're considering whether where to bring their lawsuits. Um, since T.C. Heartland, you can see that things have changed a little bit. The uh, orange at the bottom, 22%, is the District of uh, Delaware. Um, now that has gotten more cases 
filed in it than Eastern District of Texas, although they're still 11%. That's still now the second largest. And uh, you can see the splits as it moves up. And then, of course, uh, 40% in other locations. So the California venue, uh, Northern District and Central District have continued to maintain their uh, relative stature in terms of filings. Um, Northern District of Illinois is still up there as it was before. The um, District of New Jersey is now on the chart. Um, so I don't know exactly what that means, but somehow they've gotten a few more cases filed recently. Uh, but you can see there's been a shift to Delaware. Um, and this is another way of looking at that same data, doing comparison from 2016 to 2017. Um, you can see Delaware's shot up quite a bit. Uh, Eastern Texas, Texas has dropped a lot, and the others have pretty much maintained, although there are a few more cases filed in each of the others, California case uh, districts and Northern District of Illinois. So that's been the, the reaction so far to TC Heartland. Um, but what does it mean going forward as, you, as people start refining their thinking and, and being a little less reactionary about what T.C. Heartland did. Um, well, certainly case, one point is that cases are a lot likely to be filed, more likely to be filed in, in Delaware because that's where a lot of corporations are located. And so that's now, as you see, become a, a popular place to file patent lawsuits, and the expectation is there are going to be a lot more filed there. And as a result, uh, the District of Delaware has asked uh, four of the Pennsylvania judges from the Eastern District of Pennsylvania to come and be visiting judges uh, so that there's enough, uh, judge, enough judges to handle the workload. Um, and so that's one aspect of it. Uh, there's going to be some Pennsylvania judges involved, apparently, too. Um, but um, the other thing is that for companies who clearly have regular and established places of business in East, East Texas, nothing changes at all. So your typical retailer, for example, Walmart, um, they'll have stores in Eastern District of Texas, and if they're going to be considered as a defendant in a, in a lawsuit uh, because they're selling a product that's accused of infringing, then the TC Ireland has no effect at all on those kinds of cases. And, and you can see that there are going to be a number of companies like that where they're going to have a presence in Eastern District of Texas and therefore the local, where they're incorporated is not going to change anything in terms of that venue. And, and one example that's up here is Apple has a store in Plano, and Plano is in the Eastern District of Texas. Uh, Samsung has locations there. So a number of companies actually have uh, locations, regular and established, that uh, can be cited as the basis for venue. So that's those kinds of things are not going to be affected by TC Heartland at all. Um, another thing to look at is you know, what was the historical breakdown of where cases were filed uh, before uh, Eastern District of Texas became a popular venue in the, in the certainly in the late 90s and in 2000s, definitely. Um, and you can see from this chart that, again, the California uh, locations and Illinois were definitely very popular. Um, East Texas was not on the map at all. Um, so, and, and nor was Delaware, which is interesting. Delaware, I mean, it's on number six, but it, but it didn't rank very high in the list of uh, locations. So Delaware is now going to get a, a high, a much higher percentage of the patent cases. That's what people expect. Um, the, as I said, TC Heartland did not resolve any issues on the second part of the test for venue for patent cases. <clears throat> Excuse me. And, and that's because um, there's this question of what's a regular and established place of business, and, and also, you know, what does it mean to be in, to infringe? And so we now we come to the Raytheon case that Judge Gilstrap decided just recently. Um, that was a 
case that Judge Gilstrap decided at the end of June, June 29th, 2017. And it was, it was a response to a motion uh, by Cray, a company um, who had been sued by Raytheon in East Texas. And so he did a very thorough analysis of the entire venue statute, 1400, um, obviously focusing on the second half of the test because T.C. Arlander resolved the first half. And, and there's no, there was no dispute. Cray did not, was not incorporated in East Texas. So this was an analysis specifically of what's going to happen to venue in East Texas after T.C. Heartland and how are we going to try, we and I'm projecting now, um, how are we going to keep more cases in East Texas? And so Judge Gilstrap came up with a four-part test and we'll talk about those parts in a minute, but you can see them on the screen. Where is, and, and these by the way are, are factors in the totality of the circumstances analysis. So no one factor is dispositive. You look at the totality of these factors and decide whether venue is proper. Specifically, this is about a regular and established place of business. You know, talk about the infringement aspect in a minute because you have to have both infringement and regular and established place of business. But um, for the regular and established place of business part of the test, are they physically present there? Um, that's certainly a very heavy factor if they are physically present, but it's not necessary according to Judge Gilstrap. Um, whether there have been representations to the public, internally or externally, um, that indicate that they want people to believe that they have a regular and established place of business in the district. Um, have they received, has the company received benefits from the district? which starts sounding a lot like personal jurisdiction when you see something like that. Um, and then whether they've targeted their interactions with the district. Again, that's sort of a holdover from the personal jurisdiction kind of analysis. So he's come up with these four factors that are looked at and you have to analyze those and then weigh those. Um, in the Cray case in particular, Judge Grillstrap held that Cray, the venue was proper, and that Cray was, had a regular and established place of business uh, there, even though it had no physical presence in the district. Um, so the, when you go through the court's analysis, you'll find that he, the judge first deals with the question of <clears throat> infringement, because that's important factor as the infringement in the district as well. And Judge Gilstrap said there is infringement as long as infringement has been alleged in the complaint as infringement. There only needs to be an allegation of infringement. And so that's his test for infringement. It doesn't have to be any real showing by the defendant of infringement in the district as long as there is an allegation. If you want to read the decision, um, the uh, he goes into, in Cray, that it was a, an indirect infringement case, not a direct infringement case, so he goes into some detail about why the indirect infringement analysis and, and allegations were sufficient in that case. So he gets past that, and then he turns to the regular established place of business. He goes through the various factors that he outlines and concludes that those factors, even though there's a single salesman and he doesn't have any resonance or presence in the district, there is enough contacts with the district that it, it is tantamount to a regular and established place of business, and therefore, under uh, his analysis, venue is proper. We have uh, Representative Issa, who is a re Republican from California, um, not pleased with that decision, and uh, voiced his displeasure, and I've quoted it there if you want to read it. Um, and so there have been a strong reaction to Judge Gilstrap, as you might imagine. But uh, if you're in East Texas now, this is this is what the test is going to be. Um, so you have to you have to deal with that. And then and then of course other jurisdictions may look at this too, because there are 
quite a few jurisdictions that want to retain their patent dockets. Uh, not everybody is as, is as vocal about it as East Texas, but, but there are many jurisdictions that like to have their patent dockets. So this could be adopted by other districts and just as easily could be rejected by other districts. The other, the other thing that's come up, and this is more of a temporary issue for cases that are pending or were pending at the time T.C. Heartland was decided, was can we get out of the current venue we're in because we didn't know T.C. Heartland was coming, and so we think that it's appropriate that we be able to raise the venue defect now, even though our case has been going on for months or years, um, and the answer is maybe. Um, some courts have said that T.C. Heartland is intervening law, and therefore, even though you didn't raise a venue defect in your answer or your motion that you first filed, that it's okay, and we're going to allow you to raise it now. Um, <clears throat> recall that venue is a waivable defense under Rule 12, and so if it's not been raised in the first pleading, then it is waived. So... If it's a change in the law, courts will say that that's a factor that allows you to raise it even though you may have waived it. And other courts have said no, that it is not new law. It's always been the law since the 1940s. And the fact that the Federal Circuit got it wrong for all these years does not change the fact that it's still the law. So that's, a, that's an issue that will have to be wrestled with by various courts, and there's been a split on that issue. Um, and then finally, there's the open question of foreign corporations, because T.C. Heartland only applies to domestic corporations. Foreign corporations have a completely different um, set of factors that are considered, and there hasn't been any ruling yet on what happens to foreign corporations. Uh, foreign corporations, by definition, are not incorporated in any state, and therefore, for jurisdictional purposes, they're considered to be a residence of every state. And it's likely that cases are going to apply that definition for venue purposes as well. And then the final point here is that um, there's going to be potentially an increase in multi-district litigation because, as you know, the, you can no longer sue multiple defendants in a single lawsuit. You have to bring individual lawsuits. And now if you have to bring them in different jurisdictions, there's a higher likelihood there would be potentially some consolidation as a multi-district case. So that's the um, analysis here. And so with that, I will turn the microphone over to Chris. Thank you, Tom. So let's get started. Uh, so now we're gonna talk about this recent Supreme Court decision uh, involving Impression Products and Lexmark International. And the case specifically deals with the, the issue of patent exhaustion and the scope of patent exhaustion, and what, what's going to constitute patent exhaustion and what's not. Moving to slide 21, um, before we get into the cases, let's generally just talk about the elements of patent exhaustion. And the, the kind of the key point of patent exhaustion, it all comes down to authority and authority from the patent owner. Um, under the infringement statute, statute um, an infringement suit can be brought against uh, someone who without authority makes, uses, offers to sell or sells a patented invention in the United States. So what, what patent exhaustion stands for the proposition is if there is a sale of an item, an actual thing that's covered under the patent by the patent owner, and that's going to be the, the key, or, or someone who's got author, authority from the patent owner to make the sale, then that would be an authorized sale of that patented item. And if that if that is the case, that you have an authorized sale, then all rights in that particular patented item are terminated. And so the patent owner will not be able to, for example, sue for patent infringement of anything that happens with that item after that sale. Moving to slide 22. So before we get into the Lexmark decision, I kind of want to take a step back a little bit and, and go through some of the initial cases that kind of got us to Lexmark. The um, most recent uh, discussion of exhaustion from the Supreme Court before the Lexmark decision was Quanta Computer v. LG Electronics, which was a 2008 decision. And a little background, that case involved uh, uh, LG had owned a group of method patents on a particular computer processing uh, processes for certain types of microprocessors and chipsets. And LG licensed those patents to Intel. 
And in that agreement uh, between Intel and LG, uh, the parties agreed that um, nothing uh, in the agreement impacted the effects of exhaustion one way or the other. Um, so the exhaustion rules are going to apply as they normally would. Uh, the agreement was not going to impact that. However, um, beyond that agreement, there was also a separate master agreement between LG and Intel. And in that agreement, it required that Intel would advise its customers that although the actual Intel did products that the, the chips that Intel would be selling um, were licensed by LG, that that license did not extend to expressly or by implication to any product that you make by combining an Intel product with any non-Intel product. So here what um, LG was trying to capture here is, that, okay, I'm going to license Intel on my method claims, and obviously if Intel sells a, a chip that covers those method claims, those are licensed. However, when Intel then goes on to sell that chip to some other manufacturer that's going to use the chip in a bigger product, that license is not going to run and cover that, that larger product, um, uh, the customer of Intel. Going to slide All right, 23. Continuing with Quanta via LG Electronics. So, so there's this agreement between LG and Intel. And so then Intel, of course, uh, made the chipsets and sold the licensed chipsets to a company named Quanta. And Quanta took those chipsets and used them in unlicensed PCs, which as a whole practiced the LG methods, claim methods in the patents, uh, the licensed patents that were licensed between Intel and LG. Um, LG got wind of this and sued Quanta for patent infringement. And Quanta defended itself by arguing that it, the rights, LG's rights uh, in those patents had been exhausted via the Intel um, agreement and the sale of the Intel chips to, to Quanta. Moving to slide 24, this went all the way up and got to the Supreme Court. And in the Supreme Court, um, kind of a side note but relevant, Another issue that was in the case was whether or not method claims could be exhausted, and the Supreme Court said yes, method claims as well as apparatus claims can be exhausted if the circumstances warrant that. And um, so, so that was kind of a, an initial holding. Uh, and the Supreme Court's ultimate holding was that, that LG's uh, grant of an unrestricted license to Intel to make and sell the patents did trigger the exhaustion doctrine, even with respect to the quanta PCs. And the analysis that went into, into that uh, decision, uh, the Supreme Court held that sales of components exhaust patents if the components substantially embody the claimed invention. So in this case, we're talking about the Intel chips that were included in the quanta PCs. So the question was, do those chips substantially embody the patented claims that LG was selling? And what the court held was, Yes, um, for a couple of reasons. One, the court found that there was no re reasonable non-infringing use. Those chipsets were not going to be used for things that didn't, wouldn't have infringed LG's patents or the, the methodologies behind LG's patents, or at least the substantial key portions of those claims. And the Supreme Court also emphasized the fact that that the chipsets would infringe the LG patents, but for some non-patented items that were included, like for example, maybe like memory um, that would have to be used with the chips to, to technically meet the claims of the LG patents. But those things were non, non-innovative, non-patentable anyway. And so in that case, the LG chipsets substantially embodied kind of the heart of the, the LG patent claims. And the Supreme Court uh, kind of brushed aside that master, sir, uh, master agreement between Intel and, L and LG as a separate contractual undertaking that did not affect the exhaustion rights. Okay, moving to slide 25. So that was Quanta, 2008. So now we're getting closer to where we are today with LG. Quanta left some un, uh, important questions unresolved, um, which, as we'll find out, Lexmark ultimately answered. One was, does a conditioned sale of a patented article exhaust the rights in certain circumstances? And two, does a sale of a patented article 
outside the United States, a foreign sale, can that exhaust the rights within the United States? Going to slide 26, and that brings us to Impression Products v. Lexmark. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to discuss the, the facts of Impression pro Products v. Lexmark and, and, and a little bit into the Federal Circuit uh, considerations, and then we'll get to the Supreme Court, uh, ultimately the Supreme Court holding on that same decision. So, a little background, Impression Products... Lexmark owned patents covered, covering printer toner cartridges. So, for example, if you all have those inkjet printers, those little cartridges with um, that cost like as much as the printers, basically, that they sell. Um, and so Lexmark had patents on those that worked with the Lexmark printers. And Lexmark had various ways in which they sold those printer cartridges. One way was kind of the traditional way, which is, a, you know, again, at this high price, they would sell um, the cartridges, anybody could buy them, and there was no restriction on the use of those cartridges. You could do whatever you want with them. And you paid a premium price for that no restriction. And I don't know how this came to be, but maybe Lexmark was getting complaints about the prices. I'm not sure. But, but, but Lexmark decided to offer a second um, uh, category of printer cartridges, which Lexmark called the return program. And under the return program, a customer could get a 20% discount on the price of the cartridge. Um, but in exchange, that cartridge would have contain, contain labels that basically required that the customer only use the, the cartridge once um, and had no right to resell the cartridge. Uh, so it limited the use of the cartridge after it was uh, after it had been used. And Lexmark sold these cartridges in both the United States and abroad in foreign countries. Moving to slide 27. Now, Impression Products, who was the defendant in this case, um, would purchase used cartridges, used Lexmark cartridges, in both the U.S. and foreign countries. They'd refill, recharge the cartridges, and then they'd resell the cartridges in the U.S. to customers at, at a reduced rate. And of course, Lexmark didn't like that very much, and they sued him for patent infringement. And Impression's so defense to that was, well, your rights are exhausted. Your initial sale to your customers was an authorized sale, and it exhausted your, your patent rights. So anything that happened after that authorized sale was free to happen, including our refilling of the printer cartridges and um, uh, reselling of them. And there were... Uh, two main categories of accused cartridges. There, there were three. There were originally three categories, so we'll take the, the last one first because it didn't become a major issue. And that would be for regular cartridges sold in the U.S. Uh, so cartridges that weren't subject to any restriction. And both parties agreed that those, in those cases, the patent rights were exhausted. But the two categories that became the issue of the Federal Circuit decision and ultimately the Supreme Court decision were the uh, situation where there were the regular you know, full price cartridges sold um, abroad. And then there were for the return program cartridges with the, the use restrictions that were sold in the U.S. And the Federal Circuit, under these facts, held in both, for both categories, both regular cartridges sold in the foreign country and return program cartridges sold in the U.S., that in both cases, um, the patent rights were not exhausted. Go to slide 28, and in deciding that, the, the Federal Circuit analyzed two primary cases, Malincron Inc. versus Metapart Inc., and Jazz Photo Corp. versus International Trade Commission. Going to slide 29. So first, talk about Malincrot. Malincrot involved generally it was a medical device. It was a device for administering uh, radiation therapy. And the device specifically had labels on it that it said it was not for resale. It was a single patient uh, use only. Um, so there was uh, customers were put on notice of a restriction on the sale. And uh, Metapart, the defendant in the Malincrot case, was a company that would actually um, receive used 
um, user versions of the device from like hospitals, let's say, and would clean them up and disinfect them and then they'd resell them. And so Malincrot uh, sued Metapart for patent infringement and Metapart defended the rights have been exhausted and that the, the restriction on single patient use and no resale did not, did not change those exhaustion rights. The Federal Circuit disagreed with Metapart uh, and specifically said that a patentee's own sale of its patented article subject to a clearly communicated restriction does not confer authority to sell or use the article in violation of that restriction. So in the case of Malincrot v. Metapart, um, the Federal Circuit held that that single patient use only, not for resale label, was clear, a clearly communicated restriction. And therefore, when Metapart violated that uh, clearly communicated restriction, um, the, the sale or the, 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 there was not proper authority conferred by the patent owner Malincrot, and therefore there was not an exhaustion of the rights. Moving to slide 30. Jazz Photo v. ITC. Jazz Photo v. ITC involved a company that would purchase those um, disposable cameras, refurbish them, put new film in them, etc., and then import them and sell them in the U.S. And um, and so they, they were they were the the original sale of those disposable cameras were, were sold in, in foreign abroad. And so the question became, well, did that foreign sale exhaust the rights as to the U.S. Uh, patent rights? And the Federal Circuit um, pretty clearly held, no, it did not. That exhaustion, if it was a sale in a foreign country, that the U.S. patent rights were not exhausted. And so based on that Jazz Florida decision and the Malincrot decision before it, the Federal Circuit in the Lexmark decision held that there was no exhaustion to either uh, the return cartridges sold in the U.S. or the regular cartridges sold. Uh, abroad. Okay, slide 31. So now we get to the Supreme Court decision. It was a decision written by Chief Justice Roberts. And so issue one is regarding the um, sale with conditions, so the return program sales. And the Supreme Court, court in, a, in a nutshell held that a sale with conditions, even if those conditions could in some way be enforceable in the context of a contract, do not avoid exhaustion. So the Supreme Court is taking the opposite position the Federal Circuit took, um, frankly, both in Malincrot and then in, later in the Lexmark decision, and is saying, no, even with a restriction on use in the, in the purchase agreement, that it's, it's not, at least in the context of patents, the patents rights are going to exhaust. Uh, now, there may be some contract issues there um, to, to explore, but that's a separate issue. And the Supreme Court as it said here, in sum, Patent exhaustion is uniform and automatic. Very strong words. There's no wiggle room there. Once a patentee decides to sell, whether on its own or through a licensee, that sale exhausts its patent rights, regardless of any post-sale restrictions the patentee purports to impose, either directly or through a license. So the Supreme Court is not really um, beating around the bush here. They're, go they're going to take a strong stance here that that's, you make the sale, it's authorized, it's exhausted. And one of the reasons the Supreme Court really emphasized in reaching this conclusion was the, the impact of these, of these restrictions and, and the uncertainty of them and how that can impact com commerce. And the, the pat in the bullet here on slide 31 talks about the, they want to, they want to upset the smooth flow of commerce. And the Supreme Court, there's an example in the opinion that talks about, let's, let's, for example, you have an auto shop that likes to purchase vehicles and then like old vehicles and fix them up and put new parts on them and then, and then resell them. And the Supreme Court said, well, okay, so let's say you've got all these parts that, that this auto shop is buying to re, uh, remake this vehicle and they've got all these restrictions on them. Or there's at least there's the risk of, of all these different parts having different restrictions on what you can do with them and what you can't do with them. Well, that puts the, the, the auto shop owner in a, in a predicament who's just trying to fix his car up and, and sell it about what can I, what can he, he or she do or not do with that car when they sell it downstream. And so the Supreme Court said, we want to avoid that uncertainty, um, that concern. And so we're going to make it clear. We're going to define it clearly that if it's an authorized, if it's a sale, restriction or not, at least in the context of patent law, that it's, uh, it's exhausted. Um, so moving to slide 32. And what's the practical significance of this? 
Well, first of all, the Supreme Court, as I mentioned earlier, they did at least allude to the fact that maybe a restriction on use could be enforceable as a breach of contract. It's clearly not going to be um, enforceable as an infringement. But then that raises the question, well, what does that, what does it mean to be a breach of contract in this context? And it, because let's use the Lexmark example um, from the case. Typically, Lexmark sells these printer cartridges to individuals, and then maybe at some point the individual would sell it to a company like Impression to, to reuse it, you know, to refill it. But the the sale, that original sale between Lexmark and, is with is in privity that there, there's a privity with between uh, Lexmark and its customer is going to be you and me, individuals. This third party Impression company that may later come along and buy it from the, the customer is arguably at least not in privity with Lexmark and therefore doesn't have it. There's no con, there's nothing to breach. There's no agreement. And arguably they're an innocent bona fide purchaser of that um, printer cartridge from that customer, original Lexmark customer. And there's just, there's no, the question is, would there be a basis for Lexmark to file suit against a company like Impression in that context? Um, I guess if Lexmark, I mean, excuse me, Impression directly purchased from Lexmark, it'd be a lot easier because then you could argue that they breached a contract directly with Lexmark. But it, you know, so, so the question really comes down to, you know, what level of privity do you need to be able to go after, say, um, an Impression products? Um, so that, that, that does raise that question about how, well, well maybe in theory you could have a contract uh, that restricts use in practice. How realistic is it? Um, and as the holding says, if, if the licensee, if, excuse me, if the patent owner has a license with a licensee that authorizes the sale of products by that licensee, so in this case, LG, or using the quantum example, LG had authorized um, Intel to sell products, then um, again, any restrictions that are placed on by that licensee are not going to impact the exhaustion rights either. So if you've got a, a licensee that you've authorized to sell under your patents and you've given them that authority, you're not going to, the fact that the licensee may put restriction on it is not, is not going to insulate you from an exhaustion uh, issue later on down the road. This is different, for example, than this, the general talking pictures case, which came down in the Supreme Court in 1938. Now, uh, that case found that um, the rights hadn't been exhausted in the context of a licensee um, selling. But the, the reason why was that um, in that case, the licensee had had sold products that they had not had proper authority to by the patent owner. And so, the, uh, as I said at the beginning of this, the authority is the key. If you've got a licensee that the, the patent owner is clearly given authority to sell to, then when that licensee sells, there's going to be exhaustion. But in the flip side, if there's a, for some reason either it be a specific factual scenario, or maybe there, maybe when the license was given to that licensee by the patent owner, they they only have certain rights to sell, and they go about beyond those rights, then then the sale no longer was an authorized sale, and therefore the exhaustion is not going to carry with it. Moving to slide 33. Um, so. It raises the question, of, 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 is there a way to avoid this exhaustion issue um, with respect to restrictions? And one thought would be, is there a way to distribute products um, with true license arrangements to avoid exhaustion? Um, and the key being here that uh, it, can you, can you, could you sell the products without passing title in the product to the downstream uh, purchaser or the, me, the downstream user um, to avoid exhaustion? Um, one thought I had, throw it out there, um, would be, you know, could, could, for example, could you implement a rental, a rental program? I'll use Lexmark again as the, as the example because that's what we're talking about. Um, you know, if Lexmark chose, rather than selling the printing cartridges, but to have a subscription service where they would allow you to pay some kind of fee and they would rent out the, the cartridges to you, they'd fill them up, run them out to you, and then you use them up and you send them back to Lexmark, but you never actually buy the cartridge, you just buy the subscription to use the cartridge. So they're actually giving you, at that point, they'd be licensing you the right to use the cartridge under the patents, and they'd be renting out the actual physical cartridges, but they wouldn't be, in theory, selling you the cartridges. Maybe some kind of plan, if, if, if it fits your business need, maybe that would be one way to avoid this exhaustion issue. Um, I'm sure we're going to see cases come down in the not-too-distant future um, that, uh, where that may uh, come into play and facts like that and people try to get around uh, these issues. 
Um, and I got a question here. What are the implications from Lexmark for software that is not sold but is licensed? And I think it again. I think it comes. Down, I, I think for one thing, it's going to depend. So, I, so let's say maybe we're talking like Microsoft Word or something, where you're getting a license, but are you actually selling the product? And I, I think it's going to be a mattering of degree. And what it, what does it mean? Um, because I, and I'm not a software expert, but you know, you do. You, you my understanding, you get the software on your computer, and it's there physically, but to actually activate it, you got to have the license, right? And you got to put the code in, and you're buying. I guess technically, you're buying the. Technically, you're buying the, the the right to get the code to activate it. Um, I mean, if you if you go to the heart of um, exhaustion, if it's if it's a pure license um, and only a license, maybe arguably you have uh, an argument to be made. Um, though I'm thinking like just in the real world applicability, the way software is typically sold is through a license. Um, so because uh, we're talking about data and bits, and we're also talking about the right to download um, uh, improvements and updates and what have you. It's almost like a subscription service because you're not just buying it in one form, but it's constantly being updated. And so uh, it'd be interesting to see how that plays out. It's a little bit more nuanced than, say, if you're selling like a car or something that's a physical thing. So uh, my partner just said, uh, let me know, I, I got to get moving time-wise, <laughs> but we'll move on. Um, okay, so moving to slide 34. Um, in slide 34, this is kind of a rehash. I mean, it really comes down to, again, it's, it's a lack of authority. If the licensee does not have um, proper uh, authority, like in, in the general talking pictures case, um, it's not going to be an exhaustion. Um, I don't need to beat that with a dead horse. Um, so moving to slide 35, issue two, foreign sales. So like I said, the Supreme Court had ruled that foreign sales do exhaust patent rights, and they focused um, on uh, primarily on the Kirsting v. John Wiley Sons case, which was a copyright infringement case, which basically argued that the first sale doctrine, exhaustion doctrine in the context of copyrights, did exhaust rights in the U.S. for foreign sales. And they applied, the, the Supreme Court held in the context of patents that it's similar in subject matter, uh, copyrights and patents, and so the same rules should apply for patents. Uh, moving to slide 36, um, you see the bullet two on slide 36. Dif differentiating the patent exhaustion and copyright first sale doctrines would make little theoretical and practical sense. The two share a strong similarity and identity of purpose. Um, now, this is the, the dissenting opinion in this Lexmark case is kind of interesting on this point because Justice Ginsburg, who I believe was the only judge that justice that dissented in this case, she disagreed. Because in her opinion, the copyright laws have been more harmonized across the globe, where there's more rights across the globe and under the Berne Convention and what have you. And so she thought it's not the same. And she really latched onto the idea, well, you could be in a foreign country and have no patent rights. I mean, you have a U.S. patent, let's say, on the printer cartridges, and then go to France, and there's no patent rights in France. So why should a sale in France have any impact on your rights to sue in the United States in a country you don't even have the benefit of the patent rights on. And this kind of echoes the Federal Circuit decision, which one of their big arguments for why foreign uh, sales should not exhaust is that when you sell in a foreign country, you don't have the benefit of the patent rights to be able to allow you to increase the value and the price in that country. So you might sell in France at a lower price because you don't have it backed by the patent like you do in the U.S. when you sell it. However, the Supreme Court on that one, again, was pretty cut and dry. They said, look, you know, you decide to sell it in France at a reduced rate, rate then, uh, then you decide to do that, and your rights are exhausted. And so one practice point around this point, going forward now when you're selling in foreign countries, I think it's going to be important to consider when you're figuring out the price, um, factor in the fact that that, may, that sale may come back later on in the U.S., and you may not be able to recover if, if it's sold back into the U.S., and so that may be something that you would consider when pricing out the uh, the value of something even being sold in, the, in a foreign country. And I'm going to skip to slide 38 now because I think pretty much covered slide 37 just in my previous discussion. So practice points. Um, the first thought on avoiding uh, patent exhaustion would be to, to, to figure out, try to figure out creative ways to license and not actually sell or pass title to the product. Um, I think the question about 
software in particular is interesting because I think it, it, I mean, that's the way software is sold typically or often is in the form of a license. That becomes a little more nuanced. But I think in general, um, in most categories, if you can figure out a way to license in a way that's profitable and makes sense for your business, you might be able to avoid some of these issues with respect to um, limits on restrictions and what have you for exhaustion. Um, another thought to consider would be, you know, to the extent it's possible, maybe draft patent claims and different patents on different aspects of your products in a way that that maybe a sale would exhaust some of the some of the patents, but not all of them. Uh, maybe you, maybe the the apparatus will be exhausted, but if you if you're able to draft a method uh, on say making the apparatus, for example, maybe that won't be exhausted through a sale, for example. Um, but there, again, this would require a lot of thought, and it's going to be very specific to your specific products and, and what you're trying to sell. Um, uh, and then the last bullet, you know, is, another thought is maybe seek more patent protection abroad to, uh, for the same reason that the Federal Circuit and the Supreme Court discussed. That would give you uh, another um, uh, basis to charge more in those foreign countries, so maybe you avoid some of the pitfalls that are discussed in these cases about um, selling your, your product at a discount in a foreign country to never ever be able to reap the benefits of it when it's sold back into the U.S. Um, so that's another consideration. Um, and to the extent maybe you can take advantage of the laws in other countries with respect to exhaustion being a little different. I think that's it. So thank you very much, and um, it's a pleasure speaking with you.